Hello, everyone, and welcome to our next episode of Live and On Call with Lake Charles Memorial. My name is Allie, and I'm your host today. I'm not the physician who's on call today, but I'm so excited to be here with you to break open this topic. Um, this is a topic I've been wanting to talk about for a long time, so I'm really thrilled to be able to share this with you. Um, if this is your first time joining us. Here's what to expect. We will start with a discussion about today's topic, and then we will move to a Q&A session. These Q&A session is open for you to ask any questions in the comment section um, for whatever you want to know. Do uh, Dr. Murdoch will be with us in just a second, but um, he is here to answer those questions. So don't be afraid to ask anything. Um, and as we discuss, maybe there's something that you think about that comes up, something about you or your family member. Um, if As that comes up, go ahead and put it in the comment section below and we'll get to that at the end. Um, but as people are joining us, I'd like to introduce today's topic when it's time to ask for help. Many of us know that the last couple of years in Southwest Louisiana has been filled with a lot of loss, a lot of anxiety, fear, uncertainty, and we've seen our community come together like never before. There's some, been some really beautiful aspects of this, you know, tragedy, these tragedies that have come, but we also have seen how it can affect our mental health. So working through some of those emotions and feelings after a traumatic event or events um, may be difficult, you may gradually even develop symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. And while some of the similar simple symptoms may heal on their own after a period of time, sometimes we may feel stuck and not be able to move past that trauma. And it may be time to seek help. Today, we're going to be joined by Dr. David Murdoch. He's the expert in this topic. He is the Memorial Medical Group's newest board certified and fellowship trained psychiatrist. Dr. Murdoch is live and on call for you today. Dr. Murdoch, how are you doing? Can you hear us? Hi, Ellie. hear you very well. Uh, glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us today. There, I am thrilled to talk about this. Like I said earlier, I've been wanting to talk about mental health and particularly the struggle that it's been for Southwest Louisiana. We're almost at the two-year mark, believe it or not, of the series of unfortunate events that have unfolded globally, but particularly to Southwest Louisiana. So, before we get started, you are new to Lake Charles Memorial Health System. Do you mind introducing yourself a little and sharing a little bit about your background? Sure. Um, I uh, have been in Lake Charles now for about a year and a half. Um, part of my experience um, in psychiatry and, and part of my own story has actually contributed to my, my interest in trauma, but it actually goes back uh, many years ago. I uh, did my combined neurology and psychiatry fellow, uh, residency at Tulane in New Orleans and then a geriatric uh, psychiatry fellowship at LSU. And I um, was working at the VA hospital uh, on 9-11. And I, I noticed that we had uh, a lot of veterans sitting in the waiting room of the PTSD clinic at the, at the hospital. And they were watching the events of 9-11 unfolding on the television there in the waiting room. And we ended up admitting about half a dozen of those veterans that day uh, to the hospital. And I was their attending position for a few days or weeks um, uh, past that. And one of the things I noticed is that they were experiencing, re-experiencing events, not from watching the Twin Towers fall, not stress necessarily about what was going on in New York and DC, but they were back in Vietnam. They were back in Iraq, experiencing those horrific events as if it were happening right then, sometimes, you know, 30 years before. And I thought how interesting that, you know, current stressors, current traumas can actually trigger old traumas that sometime happened 30 years ago. I was also in New Orleans before and after Hurricane Katrina and noticed how so many of my patients that I had seen before what we call the storm, um, and then saw them six months later, and I saw how they had deteriorated significantly, cognitively, emotionally, even medically. And it wasn't just the lack of access to care or medications. These people were really much sicker, even within six months after, after the, the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina being displaced, losing their sense of self and identity in their community. And um, it, it showed how even when situations are not necessarily life-threatening and not the things that we normally think of as trauma. Uh, having traumatic events such as an adverse weather event can often trigger 
symptoms that are very similar to what we see in the full-blown PTSD that we see in combat veterans. Um, I, after Katrina, I, I played around a little bit in New Orleans, did some private practice, uh, went to New York City, worked for the uh, Mount Sinai Elmhurst Hospital. They had their own psychiatry residency program. I taught residents and students there. Um, moved to D.C. for a couple of years and was uh, on the uh, clinical faculty of uh, Georgetown and worked at MedStar Washington Hospital Center. Loved New York so much that I had to move back for at least a six-month uh, temporary assignment at the same hospital I'd worked at before. Unfortunately, that hospital turned out to be the first, the, the epicenter of the epicenter of the first wave of COVID, and we were just completely overwhelmed almost overnight. And I watched how this affected my coworkers, seeing the death and dying and sickness every day, even among some of our inpatient psychiatric uh, patients. Um, and when I started developing symptoms of my own, started having nightmares about being intubated with COVID or walking onto an elevator and having a COVID fog and, you know, encompass me and having intrusive thoughts throughout the day of some of the, the traumas that I'd seen during the day. Um, I thought, hmm, I think I know what this is and uh, I, I think it's time for a break. And so I'll move back to Louisiana and engage in some some pretty intensive self-care. So that's really what brought me back home. Uh, but I've been uh, with Memorial now for about uh, six weeks. And one of the things that we're seeing um, here, especially in South Louisiana, is patients presenting with clusters of symptoms, which don't quite fit some of the unique uh, designated diagnosis found in the DSM, uh, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Psychiatry, kind of the Bible that we go by to diagnose people. And a common occurrence is this, I'll look at someone who's been seen by a, a former provider or maybe a primary care physician, and you know they, they've come in and they say, well, doc, you know, I feel, uh, I feel I can't focus, I can't concentrate, I can't get my work done, I'm just in a fog. And um, they'll say, well, it sounds like you have ADHD. Here's some Adderall. Or I'm anxious, doc. You know, I'm, I'm worried all the time. I have tension in my body. Um, just can't get my mind off things. Well, it sounds like generalized anxiety disorder. Take some Xanax. And, and then, well, I have mood swings. I fly off the handle a lot. I'm uh, going up and down. I'm not sleeping. Well, it sounds like it may be bipolar disorder. Here's a mood stabilizer. So you get the pattern. And before the end of the interview, sometimes patients have been diagnosed with four or five different psychiatric diagnoses. They're all separate. And uh, then you look at their medical history and you see a lot of these patients with this cluster of symptoms that appear to at least superficially meet some of the criteria for the other disorders, uh, they, they tend to have a lot of inflammatory diseases, fibromyalgia, chronic pain syndrome that has no known physiologic origin in some cases, uh, diabetes, uh, cardiovascular disease. And these patients do tend to cluster. And I, I look at things like this and I say, this person has five or six psychiatric diagnoses, many of the, the similar diagnoses medically that I see other people have with the same psychiatric symptoms. No one could possibly be this unlucky to have all these disorders and there not be any kind of under underlying thread. Um, and they can't be independent of one another. And, and this, um, where, where you really learn about the underlying causes of this, this syndrome or these cluster of symptoms is, is looking at a social history. And um, we, we do see that a common underlying thread is simply adverse life events. Now, we all have daily stressors. We all have adverse life events throughout our lives. But um, it was through the study and discovery of the diagnosis of PTSD that we've learned so much more about trauma, even the little traumas, which we'll call the little T's in, in our lives and how they can affect our brain function. Uh, PTSD wasn't even a diagnosis. It wasn't part of the DSM until about 1980. There had been a lot of studies done in the 60s and 70s on combat veterans, mostly returning from Vietnam. And they, they found a particular cluster of symptoms uh, which, in which people had experienced a usually a violent, imminently life-threatening situation in which they would go on to develop chronic symptoms. Um, and these had to do with hyperarousal, emotional numbing, re-experiencing the events in the form of nightmares and flashbacks. 
And so they came up with a pretty, pretty solid diagnosis. Um, but the, the diagnosis is very limited and very, very specific. In other words, to have the diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder, according to the DSM, you have to have had an imminently life-threatening event, sexual violence, or witnessed it happen to another person, or else learned that it's happened to someone close to you and, and, and experienced it kind of vicariously. Um, that doesn't apply to most of the stressors and the traumatic experiences that most people have in, in, you know, throughout their lives. But with the discovery of PH, uh, PTSD, there's just been an, an explosion of academic research into uh, adverse life events and how it, it can produce some of these same post-traumatic uh, stress-related symptoms that, that often get uh, overlooked. In the early 2000s, there was a study that uh, looked at adverse childhood events, and they came up with this ACE or ACEs score. And we found that there was a clear correlation between not necessarily imminently life-threatening events, but, but trauma, um, even things like emotional neglect, witnessing violence in the home, uh, witnessing substance abuse in the home, uh, bullying at school, emotional neglect, failure of attachments. All of these things were considered an adverse life event. And the higher your score, the more likely you were to develop, go on and develop things like major depression, generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, personality disorders later on in life, even substance abuse and even medical illnesses. Uh, and we've been able to extrapolate that and we've done more research on adults and we found that adults who experience multiple mild traumas, back to the little T's, and when they're repeated and sustained over a long period of time, they can actually result in some of these same symptoms that some of the combat veterans that were originally studied developed. They may not be as prolonged, they may not be as severe, and they may not even meet criteria for formal post-traumatic stress disorder. But what we're seeing when we see patients that don't quite fit the diagnostic criteria for major depression or generalized anxiety disorder or, or other or bipolar disorder, ADHD, the, the underlying thread tends to be adverse life events, which it's really interesting. You go back and look at in, in the infancy of psychiatry, we were blaming everything on nurture. Um, uh, before we knew about the brain, we were blaming everything on our development and our early attachments. We very unfairly blamed the mother for almost everything, which is quite unfortunate. And then later on in the 20th century, there was a paradigm shift in which we learned more about brain function and how people with, with psychiatric symptoms, this was actually a manifestation of chemical imbalances, um, was a, a term that was used for a while. Um, but basically, <clears throat> dysfunction of the brain and the chemical changes that occurred actually were producing what was responsible for mood disorders, thought disorders, and the like. So there's, there's been this debate about nature versus nurture and what actually causes mental health issues. And the studies that we've been able to do with PTSD show us that, lo and behold, both schools of thought were actually right, that life events actually influence structure and function of our brains. They can induce chemical changes in our brain that over time produce mental illness and produce psychiatric symptoms. So um, there, there's no other, there's no better place uh, to see, you know, opportunities for adverse life events than, than the region of South Louisiana. Not only have we been through the what is actually trauma of, of the COVID pandemic? Um, and, you know, most of us haven't been in imminent life-threatening danger, but uh, certainly the fear of, of life-threatening danger, the fear of losing loved ones, the social isolation that we've had to undergo because of social distancing and lockdowns, the sense of self that people have lost by the status that they had in their community prior to this. Uh, businesses closing down, people losing their livelihoods, there being economic uh, concerns and, and insecurity. All of these things integrate into how we view ourselves, how we view our identity and our sense of self. And these changes, while they're not, while they're not necessarily life-threatening in the beginning, they certainly 
threaten our integrity of self. And when I say integrity, I mean all of the aspects of our life that cause us to develop a sense of self and where we are in the world. And when this is threatened, it can often produce some of these. And when it's when it's produced multiple times over a long period of time and like two years, then we can we can certainly develop some of these PTSD like symptoms. And then you add catastrophic weather events, people losing their homes, the the safety and security of, of having one's home and feeling that threatened, the the loss and of, of social status, the loss of identity in the community. All of these things threaten the integrity of our sense of self. And when repeated over time, they they can create some of these same types of hyperarousal symptoms that we see with post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, certainly depression, anxiety symptoms. And, and that does seem to be an underlying threat. One of the, I don't want to get too bogged down in, in neurochemistry and neuroanatomy, some of which I haven't studied in, in quite a while. But um, the way that, that, that traumatic events trigger these, these symptoms is, is, and I'm simplifying things grossly, there's a very, very interesting and, and important structure in our brains called the amygdala. And it's in one of the more primitive parts of our brain, and it's basically helped us to survive as a species. It's the area that when we get a stimulus from the outside world or even from within our own, own thoughts, that we're in danger. It's the structure that sends neurochemicals to a lot of different parts of the body, other parts of the brain, and triggers this response of fight, flight, or, or freeze. Um, and with prolonged stressors or with major stressors or major traumas, that area of the brain, the amygdala, gets really ramped up and becomes hyperactive. And it's, it's, it's in that mode of fight, flight, or response all the time. So people that experience repeated smaller traumas or the big traumas often get into the state of, of amygdala hyperarousal. And it's constantly pumping out neurohormones and chemicals to other parts of the body. And the effect that it has not only on other parts of our brain, but on our bodies um, is profound. Um, it affects the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. One of the really important aspects of that is what is how it affects the adrenal gland. And when the adrenal gland is stimulated by the amygdala or in, indirectly, it secretes a, a, a neurochemical called cortisol. Cortisol is a wonderful chemical for short-term stressors and helps our bodies to get ready to, to be more efficient, to move, to fight, flight, or freeze, whatever the case may be. However, when stressors, such as what many people have been through during the last two years, are chronic and repeated, we have chronically elevated cortisol levels, and that's not a good thing. Um, what generally happens with chronically elevated cortisol levels is that the body bites back with a vengeance. And cortisol, one of the things it does, it suppresses the inflammatory response. It elevates blood sugar. It gets our bodies ready to be more efficient and to fight, flight, or freeze. Well, when the body bounces back, eventually then we see hyperinflammatory states and we can see connections with this, this condition with all kinds of inflammatory illnesses. Cardiovascular disease is considered an inflammatory disease. Cerebrovascular disease, fibromyalgia, chronic pain, migraines, all these can be related to the disruption in our immune system that chronic stress can cause. Um, it can increase our chances of insulin resistance, diabetes. It even affects and dampens down our dopamine activity in the brain. And dopamine is the, the feel good or the reward hormone uh, that uh, is released when we engage in, in pleasurable activities. And you look at uh, addictions. If you, if you relegate addictions to neurochemicals, um, basically what addictions are is, is, is an eternal quest for us to try to increase our dopamine levels by engaging in activities or in, in, in ingesting or using substances that, that raise those dopamine levels. Elevated cortisol from stress inhibits this. And that's why one of the theories that people with, with post-traumatic stress disorder who are, who've experienced numerous adverse life events have a higher risk of substance abuse. Um, it affects our serotonin um, activity. Uh, certainly people with chronic stress because of that uh, are more prone to developing depressive symptoms, anxiety symptoms. And back to some of the studies that have been done on, on certain groups that, um, 
that have typically higher levels of stress, higher little traumas throughout their life. There's a clear correlation between this and the, the manifestation of the psychiatric symptoms I was talking about and even the physical illnesses that I, I just spoke of. Um, groups that are typically oppressed in society, people of color, people in the LGBT community, people of lower socioeconomic status, all of these chronic life stressors as a result of the socioeconomic status makes us more susceptible to these psychiatric symptoms and even physical illnesses. Um, so you, you may ask, well, what do we do about this? Once we identify that we may not be looking at, you know, four or five different psychiatric diagnoses in the same person, um, and we're, we're finally realizing that, okay, this person has had a series of multiple traumatic events in their life, and sometimes it's sustained even, even into adulthood. Um, what do we do about this? Well, we've talked about neurochemicals and how these are related. Um, there is what we call a top-down approach in which we say, okay, we've got, we've got medications that can dampen down this hyperarousal response that we're chronically experiencing due to the amygdala being kind of too ramped up, causing all of these symptoms. Uh, we can try to dampen that temporarily or artificially with medications. Um, well, the problem with medications alone is that they don't really address the underlying changes that, that have occurred. They temporarily may change chemicals in our brain, and, and they, they also do not usually target specific areas of the brain that we're trying to affect. They affect the whole brain. They affect the entire body. For example, when we when we prescribe an antidepressant, uh, it not only affects serotonergic pathways in the brain, but it, it's, it affects serotonergic receptors and pathways in our gastrointestinal symptoms, thus side effects with, with most medications to some degree. So medications are certainly useful and helpful in, in helping to dampen down the hyperarousal that we see that's, that's contributing to all these symptoms. but we can't stop there. We, we really have to take a more holistic approach. And that's where a lot of therapies that have been underutilized, um, you know, really need to be looked at more and, and considered. Psychotherapy, while inside alone, doesn't necessarily fix a problem. What psychotherapy, whether it's group or individual psychotherapy does, it actually engages our frontal cortex. And the frontal cortex is the thinking part of our brain that more recently evolved and it's kind of the seat of our executive function where we are able to interpret things and plan and execute complex tasks with post-traumatic stress disorder and and many other psychiatric illness the frontal lobes um, particularly the prefrontal cortex is inhibited it doesn't work correctly we're not able to think uh, Rationally, in many cases, we were in a fog. We can't plan and execute complex tasks. There's mood changes. So what psychotherapy actually does and the talk therapy is, is um, it's not simply understanding our problems, but it's actually that we're engaging our prefrontal cortex and we're engaging those thought processes and we're strengthening those connections, which can indirectly dampen down those symptoms that are causing anxiety and hyperarousal. Uh, another thing that we see with uh, specifically full-blown post-traumatic stress disorder is dissociative symptoms and depersonalization where people will say that half the time they feel like they're outside of their body. They don't, they don't have a good sense of where their body is in space and in time. And that's a function of part of the prefrontal cortex. And what, what engaging those areas does is brings back that mind-body connection. And we found that a lot of somatic therapies there's been a lot of studies that show uh, that even yoga or regular exercise directly affect our connections in our brain. And it's not just the endorphin rush that we get from exercise, but um, the stimulation of basically the free prefrontal cortex allows us to kind of think our way into better mental health. Um, uh, other, other things that engage our higher functions of the um, Social uh, engagement is one of the greatest mitigating factors to um, addressing post-traumatic stress disorder. I, I remember when I was in Houston after Hurricane Katrina, the VA did something very nice there. They built us a satellite clinic for the New Orleans veterans, and it was staffed by New Orleans employees. We played 
New Orleans music. We decorated it up for Mardi Gras. We served red beans and rice and gumbo every day. And the people would just come in that were incredibly traumatized. And you would just see them light up just to have that sense of community, uh, just interacting people with whom they had a, a connection with. So certainly social engagement. Uh, and I know that that's been difficult during the pandemic because we're kind of relegated sometimes to Zoom meetings and social distancing. But reconnecting with those people in our community that help to form our identity in the community can be a tremendous mitigating factor in, in some of these symptoms. Um, there is a, well, it's not relatively new. It's been out now, I guess, about 10, 10 or 15 years, something called eye movement desensitization reprogramming or EMDR. And this is shown to be very effective with um, trauma victims uh, specifically, particularly when there's been a major life trauma, like the big T's we were talking about. But it can also be a, a, a great treatment for people that have had multiple chronic, repeated minor traumas and that are having the same symptoms. Um, other, other somatic therapies that basically just increase our awareness of our surroundings, that, that whole mindfulness meditation type thing uh, is found to be very effective. So you're not being shortchanged if your doctor prescribes take yoga lessons, join the gym, uh, eat healthy. Uh, all of these things are actually strengthening the mind-body connection. They're engaging our prefrontal cortex, which is actually chemically dampening down the lower areas of our brain that are really on fire and 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 hyper reactive and in that in that hyper arousal state that leads to a lot of these symptoms that, that I've talked about. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Murdoch, do you want to take a second to talk about the HUD grant from the city of Lake Charles that um, may be useful and, and really helpful for people who are listening? Yes, there has been a housing and urban development grant to the city of Lake Charles for for people that meet certain criteria. And it's uh, it's I think at this time being underutilized. Um, it's uh, you have to meet certain criteria, um, specifically if your mental health issues are related to COVID-19 pandemic. I can't imagine anyone with mental health issues in the city that it's not been they've not been contributed to by what we've been through during the pandemic. If you're underinsured or uninsured, you you meet criteria. If uh, if you're uh, low to moderate income, um, and if you live in Lake Charles City proper, those are all criteria for for this program. And what they're offering is um, is individual and group psychotherapy. Um, for for these issues so i would encourage everyone even if it's just the the functioning of of social interaction to engage in group therapy um, you're actually making positive changing changes and positive connections from just just that human interaction great and if you guys have any questions go ahead and put them in the comments um, this is a good time for dr murdoch to answer any of your questions or anything that has been brought up as you're thinking and listening to um, some of his experiences maybe. Um, a lot of people in a lot of communities, Dr. Murdoch, help, mental health is a little bit of a taboo subject. What is your advice to people who are reluctant to ask for help? Well, it's, it's, it's still definitely that way. And uh, I think that the advent of biological understanding of mental illness and not just us seeing this as a nature, a nurture problem um, has, has mitigated a lot of that stigma. Um, we know without controversy that symptoms of mental illness are a result of chemical interactions and brain dysfunction in the same way that heart disease, liver disease are a function of organ, uh, organ dysfunction. And what we're actually treating is not a person's character or their willpower. We're treating their brain dysfunction. And in the same way that we would treat someone with, uh, with diabetes or, or cardiovascular disease. Um, the, the, what makes this difficult, I guess, to understand and conceptualize is that many times the treatment that we're providing is actually in the form of talk therapy or somatic therapies. And it's hard for people to make the connection. Well, how is that going to improve my brain function? But we've seen through an enormous amount of research that positive life experiences, positive um, 
interactions with others, positive concepts that we get through psychotherapy actually do create changes in the brain and that the brain is a very plastic thing. It can change for the better or for the worse over time. And um, certain areas of the brain can regenerate. Certain areas of the brain can form new connections to help us to feel better. Um, medications, um, one of the one of the things that I, I try to explain the most to my patients is that medications do not make the world a beautiful place. They don't solve our underlying problems. They simply try to get our brain chemistry back to normal until we can engage in therapy, engage in all of the self-care uh, things that we need to do to improve the way we feel. So uh, the notion that if you're prescribed a medication that you're going to be on this for life and you're going to be dependent on this medication, uh, that's just that's not consistent with what we're we're attempting to do when, when treating psychiatric symptoms. Gotcha. Again, if you have any comments um, or any questions for Dr. Murdoch, please go ahead and put them in the section below. Um, could you tell us a little bit more, Dr. Murdoch, about the types of patients that you see? Maybe any other particular um, common issues that you help treat or the age groups that you see? Well, I, I treat primarily patients 18 and older. I do have additional training in geriatric psychi psychiatry, and I've treated a lot of dementia patients. Um, dementia is certainly something that is affected by traumatic life experiences. Um, um, I treat basically the run-of-the-mill um, major depression, generalized anxiety disorder, bipolar disorder. We have a few patients with schizophrenia here. Um, very common thing that we see is comorbid uh, substance abuse. We do provide Suboxone treatment here for people that have problems with uh, opioid dependence that may have gotten started quite innocently by being prescribed an opiate after surgery. Um, some of the research suggests that you can become physically addicted even after um, a week or more of, uh, of being prescribed an opiate. So that's certainly a, a, an area of concern here in our community. Uh, we don't have necessarily a, a full-fledged outpatient, like a intensive outpatient substance abuse program here, but we get people started with medications. We, we, we see what their psychotherapy needs are, uh, what their social needs are, usually make referrals to either inpatient or outpatient programs that provide that more intensive substance abuse treatment. But uh, we, we kind of make the assessment here. Uh, we we do have suboxone therapy uh, and um, get people going in the right direction, whether that's uh, intensive outpatient programs, inpatient programs, or sometimes 12-step programs are uh, a great a great help for these patients. Great. So if you were thinking about during this time, you're thinking about it's time to take that next step to ask for help, or it's time to take that step to just engage in conversation about what's been going on with your own um, traumatic events that have, we've all been through. Dr. Murdoch is a great physician to talk to. His phone number is 337-480-7800, and his clinic is located at 2829 Fourth Avenue in Lake Charles. Um, I, I'm not seeing any questions coming in live, but you guys, if, um, if you're watching this later and we're not live, if you have some questions, we can go, go ahead and get in contact. I can get in contact with Dr. Murdoch and we can get some answers for you as well. But of course, he is available and taking new patients. So you're welcome to call his office. I know this is an extremely enlightening to me, Dr. Murdoch. Um, one of the things that I'm going to take away from this is just thinking about those little traumas differently than just, you know, we usually associate post-traumatic stress disorder with combat or with um, huge traumatic life events. But, you know, thinking of those symptoms in the same way with these one after the other tiny little traumas, like you talked about. So I will definitely be more aware of that in my own life and my loved ones. So I thank you for that and that enlightening experience that you had. Um, do you have anything else to add before we sign off? No, uh, I do welcome questions and we'll monitor the, um, the, the site and, um, you know, feel free to call and ask questions, uh, write questions in. Um, a lot of times people are, are nervous about having an initial mental health evaluation. Basically, what we're trying to get is a, a list of your symptoms, how they're making you feel, uh, medical history, uh, psychosocial history, 
it's not a deep kind of analysis type thing that you see on TV where you're laying on a couch or, or anything like that. Um, so yes, if you do have any concerns, any questions, if this is adversely affecting your life, your relationships, your level of functioning, please reach out for help because there, there, are, there are many effective treatments and we don't have to continue to suffer from these symptoms needlessly. We do have one question that came in right in the nick of time. Um, so this question asks, do you help with people that have been through depression? And I think that you kind of covered that at the end that you do, right? Of course. And, and there again, I want to emphasize that the approach should be holistic. It should not be focused on, okay, they're having these symptoms. This uh, Let's get out the cookbook and write an antidepressant and send them on their way. Um, it's important to understand what types of traumas that people have experienced, is what type of adverse life events they've been through, what their social situation is. And uh, I rarely just prescribe an antidepressant without also refer referring a person to psychotherapy. I think that's, that's a very integral part of mental health treatment. All right. Well, that about covers it. Again, if you need to make an appointment with Dr. Murdoch, his phone number is on the screen. Um, and thank you again, Dr. Murdoch. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for we will inviting see me. you guys next time. We have we do these live streams periodically about different topics. And so if you're interested in learning more about different specialties, these live and on call streams um, will be available on our Facebook page for you to hear from different specialties, different doctors and um, get the help that you need. So thank you again, and we will see you later.